Hi, welcome to the All Things LGBTQ interview show, where we interview LGBTQ guests who are making important contributions to our communities. All Things LGBTQ is taped at Orca Media in Montpelier, Vermont, which we recognize as being unceded indigenous land. Thanks for joining us and enjoy the show. On All Things LGBTQ, we have been reaching out to those members of our community who have chosen to serve in a public capacity, either in the Vermont Senate, the Vermont House, or in our local municipalities. And joining us today is a member of the Burlington City Council. Please welcome Joe McGee to our first All Things LGBTQ interview. Welcome, Joe. Thank you, Keith. Thanks for having me. I'm glad to be with you. Okay, so let's start with a little bit about you. You know, what is your connection to Vermont and to Burlington? And, and maybe a little bit about your involvement in politics or activism before you went on to the Burlington City Council? Sure, yeah. Um, so I was born in Boston. Um, my dad was from Boston. My mom was from Waterbury. And uh, I lived there for about eight years before I moved to uh, Waitsfield. Um, I went to public school in the Mad River Valley. I went to Harwood Union. Um, I graduated there in 2013 and uh, applied to several schools in Boston for college and applied to UVM with a bunch of my classmates. Um, we all said we weren't going to stay in Vermont for college, but, um, you know, a sizable portion of us ended up staying and uh, going to UVM. And um, so I came to UVM in the fall of 2013 and uh, studied business and um, I ended up taking a gap year uh, while I was at UVM and working on Bernie's first presidential campaign. Um, you know, I had not really been that involved politically before that. Um, I didn't really see myself uh, going into politics or uh, working on campaigns, but, you know, there was something happening in Burlington and um, Bernie was, uh, you know, headquartered the campaign and they were looking for interns. And I said, you know what, I need to, I need to see what this is about. Um, it, the early days of that campaign and ended up being 15 interns in a trench coat, essentially running that headquarters, uh, doing the mail and answering the phones. And um, it was really special to be a part of that. Um, and so that was sort of my first, my first look. Um, I decided to take a year off and uh, go all the way to the convention with Bernie in uh, 2016. And um, I ended up going to Florida the night before the um, general election uh, to do an event down there and um, flew home on election day. And I, you know, I fell asleep before the final results were in. Um, and so I woke up at, I think it was three in the morning and saw that um, Donald Trump had won the election. Um, and, you know, I was incredibly disheartened that uh, the work that I'd put in for over a year, so many people had put in, um, and the implications that it would have um, for the queer community, for uh, people of color, um, it was just really disheartening. Um, and so, you know, from then on, uh, I knew that being involved politically wasn't just a, a career choice, but it was something that um, uh, was going to be incredibly important going forward. Um, you know, because, you know, I grew up comfortable. I had roots in uh, the working class and my grandfather was a Boston firefighter. Um, my uh, grandmother raised six kids after he died in the line of duty. Um, she was a, an Irish immigrant. And, um, you know, we 
never had a lot of money, but um, we also never really had to worry about money. So, um, you know, finding a route in um, political activism for me uh, really became apparent in those um, months during the 2016 election. It, it was no longer something that was optional. It was something that all of a sudden became essential Absolutely. to your survival. So how do you make the leap from working on Bernie's campaign to then deciding that you're going to that you wanted to serve on the Burlington City Council? I, uh, you know, I went back to school. I finished my degree at UVM in 2018. Um, and, you know, during that time, I had worked for uh, a gay candidate in Boston to try and get them elected to the uh, city council there. Uh, that campaign came up short. Um, but, you know, I kind of saw um the ways in which organizing can uh, not get you to the finish line uh so often um and how we have to not agonize over those defeats but see them as learning opportunities and a chance to um, do better in the future and um i ended up working uh, for karina driscoll's campaign for mayor in 2018 here in burlington another campaign that came up short. Um, and then uh, just so happened that Bernie was running for re-election to the Senate in 2018. And um, I got a chance to really see the state of Vermont and get outside of Burlington. And um, uh, just, you know, I grew up in a rural area, but to really see how um, I think the things that, um, you know, the issues that a lot of people face in the state, whether it's access to health care or uh, decent paying jobs or um, access to a quality education, they're roughly the same. Um, and uh, so, you know, after that, I ended up on Bernie's 2020 presidential campaign producing events across the country. Um, and I uh, did the campaign's last event in St. Louis on March 9th, uh, 2020. Um, it was right when the pandemic was starting and we were asking ourselves if we even should really be doing an event in a fixed seat theater um, at that point. Uh, and, you know, I got sent home the next day and was in Burlington and hunkered down for quarantine shortly after that. Um, you know, I think the months that followed really put an emphasis on community and um you know the importance of looking out for each other in a way that you know we can't really expect from our government i think um and so you know i did some work uh, for the rest of that election cycle and uh, was sort of uh, tired of electoral politics at that point. I didn't really see myself represented um, in our elected officials. I didn't see um, so many of the issues that I cared about being talked about. Uh, and, you know, I think it was actually a year ago that we were in the middle of my first campaign, the special election um, for uh, the Ward 3 seat when Brian Pine was appointed as the director of the Community and Economic Development Office. Um, Brian left big shoes to fill. He's got an encyclopedic knowledge of the city of Burlington, something that I'm striving for, but uh, have not yet achieved. Um, you are still you know, a work in progress. Yes, it always will be. It's a practice, not a perfect. Um, and, you know, I kind of I was sitting around with some some folks and I was like, well, hey, I live in Ward 3. And then it's sort of like a, a ha ha moment. 
and then as the days went went on it became much more real um to the point of you know running in progressive caucus and uh ultimately winning that by a single vote um and then going on to um win the special election as well so um you know i think what it comes down to for me is so many of those economic issues i mean right now there's a palpable pain that we're all feeling and whether it's economically or from a mental health perspective um, we've all just experienced a very significant collective trauma um, and it, it's been very hard for me at times you know trying to figure out how to be the best uh, public servant that i can be and represent the community well and um, figure out how to achieve some of those solutions on a municipal level that um, we're not quite seeing from the state or from the federal governments. So representing Ward 3, that's part of the downtown and the, the old North End. What are the issues that are specifically confronting that district of Burlington that the Burlington City Council needs to respond to and how are you trying to shape those decisions that are being made? Yeah, that's an excellent question. You know, I think um, Ward 3, uh, we've got some of the most uh, populous neighborhoods in the entire state. We have some of the most diverse neighborhoods in the entire state. Um, so we're really getting at questions of equity uh, around racial equity. Um, housing justice, uh, economic justice. Um, you know, Burlington as a whole is 60% renters and uh, Ward 3 has, has uh, many of those. So, um, you know, I think, uh, I think a lot about the King Maple neighborhood. Um, you know, we're dealing with questions around the Champlain Parkway right now. And um, if you drive those Pine Street uh, intersections with King and Maple, you can see that it is not a pleasant place to um, to be at uh, rush hour. Um, and so, you know, I and others have been clear that before we dump more traffic into that neighborhood, that there's another project that needs to happen that would connect uh, Battery Street to uh, Pine Street um, and, and deal with a lot of the traffic flow that um, would be uh, dumped into the King Maple neighborhood if if that action wasn't taken. So uh, we've made support of the phase two of the Champlain Parkway project contingent on that uh, rail yard enterprise happening. Um, and so that's, that's a key um, piece that we're working on. Um, you know, I think, um, some of the other stuff that has come up is, you know, certainly just cause eviction um, passing here in Burlington overwhelmingly, um, but falling short in the state house. Um, you know, the House of Representatives failed to override by a single vote. So when we talk about a supermajority um, in the state legislature, I think, you know, it's important that when these important issues come up, that um, we're going to have a true supermajority that's going to um, override those vetoes from the governor. Um, because, you know, when we're in the middle of a housing crisis, when people are struggling to make ends meet, uh, we can't afford to, to lose these fights by a single vote. Um, so, you know, I'm hopeful with a lot of turnover in the legislature, um, a lot of um, folks running who are speaking to uh, the urgent need for um, not just more housing, but more tenant protections um, that we'll be able to get that through um, in the next legislative session. So I think those are two really important aspects of what we're working on. Um, you know, the overdose crisis is something that I have focused a lot of my energy on. 
Uh, it's personal for me. Uh, substance use was something that my father struggled with before he passed away. And, um, you know, I, for us to not be doing everything that we can uh, to support folks who are struggling with substance use disorder, um, to offer, uh, we just passed a resolution around overdose prevention sites. You know, I'm hopeful that we're going to get some clarity from the federal government uh, legally that will allow those to move forward, not just here in Vermont, but around the country. Um, you know, I think we have data that shows that they save lives and uh, for us to not pursue those um, would be a real shame. So um, that's something that I've also spent a lot of time on. And we could certainly uh, talk a lot about public safety transformation. I think that's, um, you know, it's on everybody's mind across the state. So I was going to say that that was going to be my next and my follow up question, because looking at, you know, talking about overdose prevention and, and what are the programs and the services that could be put into place to have an effective and meaningful response. Part of it is looking at how do we currently use public safety and law enforcement and the, the public media's reporting of an increase in you know, incidents occurring in and around Burlington. So what has been your involvement with trying to redefine the Burlington Police Department into a public service that truly responds to community need. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, I think this has been a, an important issue in both of my campaigns. And, um, you know, we recently took a couple of votes that um, uh, funded the police department and a recruitment and retention plan. And we just passed a union contract that gives raises to officers. Um, the council voted last fall to uh, raise the officer headcount. Um, that is a, I voted no on that, um, but I voted yes on the others. You know, I, I'm hoping that we can get to a point where we can talk about the uh, underlying solutions that um, get at the um, harm that's being caused by uh, so many systemic injustices. Um, you know, we need to make sure people's basic needs are met. Uh, there are more compassionate ways for us to address substance use disorder than uh, simply throwing more money at the police department. I think that's, you know, no one lever is going to solve these problems for us. And that is a hard conversation for us to have. Um, you know, I think for decades, we've thrown money at police departments. We've asked police officers to do far more than they're trained or equipped for. Um, the things that we ask police officers to respond to don't need a law enforcement. Um, they don't have a law enforcement answer. Uh, you know, we could, I think we've seen that with the war on drugs, uh, with mass incarceration. Uh, we haven't solved any of the problems that uh, we've set out to solve with those massive investments. Um, we have just created further divides. And um, what we really need to look at now is how we can address mental health crises, how we can house all of our people, uh, how we can make sure people are fed, that, um, that their basic needs are being met. Um, and so... You know, I think that is what we have to do going forward. And part of that is increasing accountability and transparency in the police department. Um, so as chair of the public safety committee here on the city council, um, we're going to be looking at the recommendations that were made in the CNA report last fall, uh, a really exhaustive assessment that was undertaken. And, um, you know, there are tangible goals for us to, to be able to accomplish in that. Um, and so that work will be going on over the next uh, couple of weeks to sort of finalize and formalize um, a timeline for that. And then over the next several months, working with the police department to um, accomplish those things. You're, you're talking very much about 
a root cause analysis of what, what are the true bases for the difficulties that people are encountering and what is a true and meaningful solution. And I think that as an out candidate, you may have a unique perspective on that root cause analysis. But what I want to ask you in our remaining time is, would you encourage other out members of our community to run for public office? And what advice would you give them? Sure, yeah, you know, I think um, I, I absolutely would encourage um, members of the community to run, you know, it, it's essential um, to have representation, um, to have our voices heard at the table, um, you know, being queer and being out, that's part of my identity, but, you know, I certainly can't speak for um, all of our experiences. We're certainly not a monolith. So, um, you know, it's just one part of the puzzle um, for my election. And I hope that I can uh, inspire others and be a resource to others who decide to run. Um, we certainly need to elect uh, more trans folks to office. You know, Taylor Small being the first trans woman elected to the Vermont State Legislature um, is a massive step forward. You know, I think we still see so much uh, vitriol and hate for um, trans candidates, especially and trans uh, officials. Um, you know, we have to be as present and out and vocal as ever uh, in the face of that. Um, and it's scary. It really is. And so we need to be together in that. Um, we need to build community. And, um, you know, that is how we, we build power and make the change that we need to make. Um, and so I look forward to being part of that movement um, and helping other out folks make that decision to run for office. You know, it's, it's hard. There are so many barriers to serving in elected office. Um, you know, it's I'm not getting rich doing this. That's for sure. Um, and so we need to really have a serious talk about um, why, you know, what we can do to make it so that marginalized folks are able to serve an elected office, um, and make it economically uh, feasible for people. And, um, you know, I'm a renter here in Ward 3. It's not an easy place to find an apartment. So if I were ever to have to leave this apartment, I there's a decent chance I wouldn't be able to continue to serve our community. So um, that is always something that's top of mind for me. All right. So with that, I need to say thank you for spending this time with us. I look forward to inviting you back to talk about the continued work of the Burlington City Council and maybe to interview as a candidate for a higher office. Thank you, Keith. Uh, hopefully not, not too soon. I, uh, with two campaigns in less than a year, I, uh, I'm content where I am at the moment. A, a, a little rest would be nice. Yeah. All right. Thank you so much for spending this time with us. Thank you, Keith. Hi. Hi. Um, this is Linda Quinlan from All Things LGBTQ, and we're interviewing, interviewing Ruth Farmer today. She's a poet fiction writer and essayist. She is a regular contributor to the Ways of Seeing column in the Addison Independent. Ruth's prose and poetry appears in many journals and anthologies. Her most recent publication is a poetry collection called Snapshots of the Wind. Welcome Ruth. How are you I'm, doing today? I'm doing well. <laughs> Good. Well, I guess for the audience, maybe we could talk a little bit about where you're from and how you ended up in Vermont. I was born and raised in Wilson. Um, Wilson is about 45 miles from Raleigh. Um, I graduated high school there and then I moved to Brooklyn where I lived for, lived for quite some time. And because I had a couple of friends in um, Vermont whom I visited periodically throughout that time, I decided to move to Vermont and I've been here for 30 years. 
Um, I used to, I lived in Shalott for much of that time. In the last nine years or so, I have lived in Bristol. That's a great city. Yeah, it's it's good. I like it. <laughs> couple, of, couple of good restaurants. I can't remember now, but I've driven over the hill, down the hill, and gotten to Bristol. So, um, so you, so, um, I see in, in addition to your poetry, you write essays and you're writing a column for the um, uh, Addison Independent newspaper. Mm -hmm. I was wondering, is this a weekly um, or do you just do it when you feel inspired? How does that work? Well, um, I specifically write for ways of seeing. Um, Addison Independent has a whole bunch of different kinds of columns. That's the one I write for. Um, and it's a, there's a group of us. Um, so I might write maybe three to four columns a year because there are like 10 to 12 of us, depending on the, the year. So, so we, we, we write in rotation. Um, yeah. And what exactly is ways of seeing? I mean, I, I get the idea that it's probably the ways of seeing the world or mm -hmm. yourself mm -hmm. or all kinds of inner... Well, it's really about um, each column. This has a really has has their own niche. So I I write about stuff I see out of my window how, a lot of times, uh, or I, I write about um, books I've read, or um, because I've been a teacher for so many years, I write a lot about what my students think and things that I've learned by being a teacher. Um, the last column that I have, if I can recall it, it was about um, productivity. Um, and, and in a sense, what I was really getting at was really the, the whole notion that we must be producing stuff all the time, um, and how oppressive that is basically, you know, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but I've written a column, one of my favorite columns that I, I wrote, well, the two that are favorite for me, one was, I wrote about women's sings. I don't know if you've ever heard of them, but this group of women got together and they, they, they've they been singing for years. And, and I happened to go to a couple of their workshops and how moved I was by it. And the other one was about the series that um, Louise Penny writes, uh, uh, Amon Gamache's um, series, um, and the advice that he's, he got from his mentor, like, you know, say you don't know, um, apologize, that's, say, I don't know, I'm sorry. I need help. Those kinds of that that kind of advice. Yeah. Um, so it, that's the kind of thing that I write about. Well, you probably know that Becky Allen, who's running for uh, Congress, put together her collection of essays that she wrote for the Brattleboro the Brattleboro Reform newspaper. Mm -hmm. So I was wondering, are you thinking about putting these together, maybe as a individual or as a group for publication it sounds like it would be really um a very interesting thing to do i am writing um i am um thinking of collect um writing a collection of essays and i will probably use some of those pieces yeah 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 i don't know that anyone is uh, has even thought about um having in ways of seeing anthology that's a great idea <laughs> I think it is. And hers was hers is called um I think it's Woman in oh, I how, so, uh, in a yellow jacket, I think, or something to that effect. But it's all columns that she wrote. It's really it's really well done. Um very kind, very um you're talking about everyday life. And it sounds like it's similar to maybe what you all are doing there. And I would be great to put it together as an anthology. Yeah, uh, I will suggest that. <laughs> <laughs> and I would say that it was your idea. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, it was Becca Bell, but you know, uh, I, I, liked, I liked hers a lot. It was really a good read. Um, so you do poetry and prose. What do you, what do you think is the difference? I mean, do you have a different feeling when you're doing both or does it come from the same source? They both come from the same source. I would say I have more of a poetic sensibility, but prose is really what I enjoy writing mostly. Um, so I write, I do write fiction, although um, 
One of the things that I like about writing fiction is that I don't feel as invested in it in the sense of like, it's not my soul. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. I, I have more fun when I write fiction. Let's put it that way. Um, poetry and prose. I, you know, that's a really good question. Um, from a structural point of view, they are shaped by different um, different things. Poetry is, is um, shaped by lines, um, whereas prose is usually shaped by sentences. Unless, of course, you're doing a prose poem, which I'm not going to even get into, okay? So, <laughs> yeah, we won't go there. that. I'm not going there. Um, <laughs> but yeah, so the integrity of the piece of, of poetry is often in the lines, um, in the lines, the imagery. Um, there's there's sort of this these moments that oftentimes seem disconnected, although sometimes people write narrative poems and they're telling a story and, you know, I, I do that sometimes. But yeah, it's a really good question because sometimes you, you sort of say people are like, well, is, is that poetry? And sometimes it's not. I mean, sometimes yeah. it's just prose written in lines, <laughs> so, which is a totally different thing. Um, but yeah, it's a it's a very good question, and I wonder, you know, have you asked that question to a lot of poets? What what do they say? <laughs> well, you know, they. I, I'm a poet also, and um, but I don't write essays. Um, I, I I stick with this particular genre, but um, they have all different kinds of answers, like um, you know. Uh, I'm inspired by one thing to express it one way or another. Um, if you want to get a different point across, you would use an essay, but if you want to get a different, maybe a, a feeling, um, not that you couldn't do it in both, but poetry sort of has a structure in which uh, it gets a feeling across differently mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and in a different kind of uh, a way. So there are lots of different answers to that. Um, yeah, it's a, it's a hard question to answer, I think. It really is. It's sort of uh, like the one I'm going to ask you now, which is, over your lifetime, who's inspired you? Who have you felt like you really liked and, and you know, maybe mentored you? Uh, um, as, as far as poetry is concerned, I, I like a lot of poets, actually, um, for different reasons. Um, I, I like Lucille Clifton, June Jordan, Billy Collins, W.H. Auden, Karen Miriam Goldberg. Um, I like um, Laura Wisniewski. I don't know if you know her. She's a local poet. Um, let me see. I like a lot of poets. And, that, and I would say, so for example, if I, I mentioned Auden, and I it, it's because he, he um, he was so in, um, invested in the craft of it. Um, I would say he was a really good craftsman and he would probably think it was an insult, but I, I think it's really great. <laughs> yeah. Um, I like Billy Collins because he has a sense of humor. Mm -hmm. um, I, liked, um, I liked June Jordan because her, her poetry was so immediate and fierce in that she wrote about what she saw in the world and um, she always took chances about her, the, the politics in her poems. Yeah. Um, and Lucille Clifton, I, I, I really, I, I would say she writes, she wrote, she used to write poems that I wish I had written. Let's just put it that way. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> because they, they seem so simple, but they're very complex. Um, I know yeah. that's a real art, isn't it? Like to yeah. get something so profound in, in, in simple words and simple ideas. And yeah, yeah. Really and I like Joy Hydro. Um, she's, um, her poems are, I won't say her poems are mystical, but she, she some, sometimes when she's talking about poetry, it feels very mystical. Um, it's almost like, I feel like this lightning bolt comes down and invests in, in her and then the poem comes out, you know, but she, but she's also someone like Collins and Jordan and Alden, who spent her life, I mean, she spent her life writing poetry. That's who she, she is a poet, mm -hmm. you know, like she, yeah. you know, some of us write poems. She is a poet, you know? Yeah. Yeah. So where do you get your, all right. So where do you get your inspiration? Do you, do you write on schedule or do you 
Are you in the elevator or someplace and uh, it comes to you, uh, something you may want to write about, or do you have a schedule? You sit down every day and our conversation. I write most days. Um, sometimes I go through periods of writing a poem a day because, um, you know, when I was, um, when I was a, a student at Bennington College, one of my professors said it doesn't have to be good. It just has to be done, you know? And so like, I would just write these poems and that's what I do every now and then I write a poem a day. Um, and sometimes they become poems and sometimes they're just stuff that I write. Um, other times I write um, journal entries and I, so I reread them and see which would become a poem and which would become an essay mm -hmm. and which I would just keep to myself. So, <laughs> so yeah, I write just about every day. Yeah. And would you be so kind to read a few poems from sure. your collection for us? Okay. Let's see. The first poem is What's Seen and Not Seen. Unlike an oak tree, a paper birch does not have a reputation to uphold. It pops up in the middle of wherever because it can. Maybe it ran away from home, relocated after being squeezed out by maples and pines, got lost wondering if it could touch a passing cloud. Its lone white barked presence is normal among brown trunked tree families, nearly invisible until it chooses to show its rebel self. And is this something you see, you, you saw from your window? I, I actually, the thing about birches is that you you it is it is true that you you sort of walking around and suddenly there 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 it is you know so I happened to be on my property and I I, I saw this birch and uh, and realized it's been there all along and I hadn't even seen it uh -oh. you know what I'm saying like it's just been there yeah. just hanging out you know <laughs> doing its thing yep <laughs> very nice you, and, um, go ahead um. You know, I noticed that with green too. It's like in, in like I lived in Boston most of my life, and it, in the winter it's bleak. Um, but up here, there's all that white, as you were talking about the birch, but also the green. The evergreens are everywhere, so there's even some color I think in the winter, which is kind of different and nice, and I really enjoy that. So. Yeah, yeah. And you have another poem you read? Sure, I can read another one. Scribe. Dappled sunlight casts the tree's happy dance on my living room floor. Orange is my heart. Green is my love. Yellow is the energy that beams my smile inside and out. My purple wisdom shifts up and down. I'm an involuntary scribe compelled to shudder my ra rational mind and release my wildly hopeful, joyful brain, glad to be alive. My solitary journey yields and connects with the black-capped chickadee, the chubby groundhog, the persistent wind, families of trees, translucent dragonflies and multi-appendaged spiders. Every living thing is co-author of the story of this home called Earth. The narrative fills our minds as we dream a world where inside and outside are one boundless place. Oh, thank you. That's great. Um, do you have any readings coming up uh, in the near future? And where can people buy your collection? Well, I've done a whole series of readings in the libraries around um, um, around and near Addison County. So I was in Bristol, um, Lawrence Memorial Library. I, I did a reading at um, Billsley in Middlebury and the very fabulous Bixby in Virgins. That is a beautiful library. I love that library. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, the next um, reading I have will be at um, Tellis House at Middlebury College. It's a lunchtime and reading next Tuesday. Okay. Yeah. And where could people buy your book? Uh, um, a web page to which they could go to, or yeah, I have a web page, RuthFarmer.com. You can buy it there. You can buy it at um, Amazon or at lulu.com, 
lulu.com. Great. Well, thank you so much for coming on the show. It was great. And um, do you have any last words for the audience? Uh, no, thank you for um, inviting me. And um, yeah, I'm just very grateful that so many people have really loved my books and have been buying them and buying them for gifts, which I really, for me, that's what, it's, what it is. It's a gift. And the um, holidays are coming. Perfect opportunity. <laughs> So it's, 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 it's done what I wanted it to do, which is to share my, my words with others. Um, so I'm very grateful for it. And thank you so much for inviting me. Well, thank you so much for coming. I really appreciate it. And the audience will be thrilled. Okay. So thank you so much. Bye-bye. Thank you for joining us. And until next time, remember, resist. <laughs>